Well, good morning again, LC. Everybody feeling good? Awake? You're surviving the summer heat? We're making it? It's been a hot one this week, right? I mean, just painfully hot. Well, we're glad that you made it today. I'm super excited as we're in week two of Suit Up. Everybody say Suit Up. We're walk- oh, I like you said it with some attitude. Suit up. I like that. And so we're walking through, y'all are funny. We're walking through Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And he's talking to them about how in life that we're caught in the middle of a spiritual war. That there's a war that's happening between the heavenlies that we can't see between good and evil. And that for us to be able to survive and for us to be able to thrive in it, we need to suit up. We need to put on the full armor of God. And Paul has some great experience, some firsthand experience in understanding armor because for a season of his life Paul was in prison and that's when he wrote this book the book of Ephesians to the church of Ephesus and even for a number of years Paul was chained to a Roman centurion for years every day every four hours they would switch out and a new guard would come in and would be chained to Paul because he had this pesky habit habit of escaping prison he was like the Houdini of the New Testament because God would rattle the cages and let him go so he could go and preach the gospel. And so he had a firsthand view of seeing what it meant for a man to wear some armor. And so he talks about that. If you missed last Sunday, man, I would really encourage you to go online, listen to it, watch it, because it's the foundation of why we need the armor, the foundation of what is this battle that we're in. It's kind of sci-fi. What are you, Pastor, what are you talking about? Go and listen to last week. It will help you define and understand how we are truly in a battle in our daily life. So let me read to you what we talked about last week. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says this. Finally, everyone say finally. Finally, Finally, be strong. He says, finally, be strong in your life that we are created to live with strength. And if you're a believer and love Jesus Christ, but you're living life from a weak vantage point, then you're not stepping into everything that God has for you. He's created you to be strong. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, that our strength comes from God, right? Our strength doesn't come from our mind, from our muscles, or from our money. That's not where our strength comes from. Our strength comes from the Lord. So he says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, and put on the full armor of God. He's saying, this is not a pick and choose armor. You can't just say, yeah, let me get a little bit of salvation, but I don't need to grow my faith. He's saying, put on the full armor of God. And it's important because putting on an Putting on armor is an indication that you're about to be in the fight, right? If you put on a Halloween costume, you're about to be trick-or-treating. But if you put on some armor, it's an indication that there is a battle coming. And so he says this. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You know, the Bible tells us that enemy, the devil, is a strategist. That he builds and he creates methods that he can come into our lives and bring chaos and bring turmoil and bring destruction. The Bible tells us that we as believers are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. That there's people in the heavens that are looking down and encouraging us and cheering us on that when one person accepts Jesus into their heart, that all of heaven rejoices. So there's this visual that heaven is up there looking down on earth, cheering for us. But the antithesis, the opposite of that is also true, that in hell they're looking up and they're trying to bring destruction. And how we have this visual of Satan in a boardroom standing at a big table calling in specialists. And he calls in anger and lust and manipulation. He calls in insecurity and he calls in bitterness. And he says, hey guys, come in here. Let's create a plan. And then he takes your picture out of a folder and he slaps it up on a whiteboard. And he says, today we're going to bring destruction to this person. We're going to do it. Here's the timeline. Here's the strategy. Here's the layout and how we're going to destroy this person's faith, this person's belief, this person's vitality. Here's how we're going to attack them. And Paul's saying that we have to suit up so that we can live through this attack that's coming against us. And it goes on and it says, uh, it, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So because of that invisible war, it says, therefore, Put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand, stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. And I love it that the Bible tells us to stand. And if you notice, it doesn't tell us to fight. The reason it tells us to stand and not fight is because the victory is already ours. Amen? That Jesus already won the victory. You see, as we are standing, we are not fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory. That he has created us and he's given us victory through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection. So what we need to do is we need to suit up 
so that we can stand in our faith. We need to suit up and stand leading our families. We need to suit up and be the ministers that God has called us to be because God has already given us the victory. 1 Corinthians 15, it says this, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you missed last Sunday, please go on, watch it, listen to it, and allow some of that to get into your mind to understand that we're in a battle. And the verses go on, it says this in verse 14. It says, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil ones. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kind of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. You see, God has provided for us this armor, these tools, these things that we can suit up in so that we can take our stand. But you know, just because something is provided for you doesn't mean that you're applying it to your life. You know, growth is application. You can learn something and not apply it, and it's not going to do anything for you. It's like going to the doctor, and they give you a prescription, and then you don't fill it or take it, right? We have a friend here, Amanda. She was in the first service. She's a physical therapist. And I was talking to her this week, and she said, you know, Tristan, one of the most frustrating things is to meet with a patient who's lost mobility, So they lose mobility, and I send them home, and I give them some exercises. And she says, time after time, they go home, and guess what? They don't do the exercises. And then they come back to her the next week. They have no more strength. They have no more mobility because they didn't apply the thing that they were learned. So just because God has provided all of these things for us doesn't mean that we have them unless we put them on, unless we're intentional about suiting up because we really do live in a war. So Before we get into today, we're talking about the belt of truth. Before we get into it, I want to just uh, illustrate one thing and talk about one thing that Paul tells us. On your seat, there was one of these cards when you came in. We gave you a little cheat sheet so that you can walk through and understand all the different pieces of armor and what they do. But I noticed something really unique, and it's this. It's that when Paul uh, introduces the different pieces, that he divides the armor into two categories of three. He divides the six pieces into two categories of three. The first three are introduced with the verb to be, to be strong. That it's the, what we're supposed to be living in, we're supposed to be strong. But he introduces the second three with the verb to take, to take up. So the first three, were, it's what we're supposed to be in. It's how we're supposed to live our life. It's how we're supposed to walk our life. But the second three, we're supposed to take up. And so I would ask myself the question, why does he switch verbs in the explanation of the six pieces? Well, it's because he wants us to understand the distinct orientation of all the different pieces. Because the pieces, they serve different functions. So the first thing that he says uh, in Ephesians 6 is he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and feet fitted with peace. So he's saying that you need to be someone who has truth. You need to be someone who has righteousness. You need to be someone who walks with peace. But then he says that you need to take up. There's some things we need to take up. We need to take up the understanding of our salvation. We need to take up our faith, and we need to take up the word of God as a weapon. The best explanation that I can give for it is a baseball player. You know, a baseball player, they go into playing a baseball game, and they wear their uniform the entire game, right? Why? Because that's the state they are in. They're in the state of playing baseball, so they wear their whole uniform. But there's times in the game when they have to take up other instruments, right? They go up to bat, and what do they do? They take up their bat so they can swing. When it's time for them to go into the field, they take up their gloves so they can do that thing. The Roman soldier would do the same thing. As Paul was shackled to a soldier, he realized something. He realized that the the soldier always had on their belt, that they always had on their breastplate, and they always had on their shoes. If they're just hanging around town, eating lunch, right, updating their Facebook profile, whatever the Roman soldier is doing, they always have on these three pieces, Except then when they're about to get into a fight, when it's about to go down in funky town, then what do they do? Then they grab their helmet, then they grab their shield, then they take up their sword. And so there's this idea that God says, hey, I want you to live your life always having truth. Having truth in your heart to gird yourself with truth. I want you to live life righteously. 
to not just be righteous on Sunday, but be righteous on Friday night when nobody's looking at you, right? That we're supposed to live our life righteously. And that I want you to have peace. Not just peace about some things, but a peace that surpasses understanding over every situation. So he's saying that's who we're supposed to be, but then there are also some things that we're supposed to take up. Is that good? Y'all understand it? So there's, there's a delineation of the different, different pieces that we need to take up and that we need to be in the state that we were called to be in. So the first one that I want to talk about today is the belt of truth. Now when I think about the armor, the, visually the first thing that would come to my mind is the helmet or maybe a shield or the breastplate, this big ornate powerful piece. And you wouldn't very often even think of the belt as being a very important piece. You know, for us, we think of a belt, and a belt is simply a uh, piece of leather that's an inch or two inches wide that is a fashion statement, right? We've got to make sure our belt matches our shoes. What's up now? Y'all, y'all know you like that, right? And so, we, so we, we try to color coordinate our belts. We try to make them look good, but most of the men in the room, I would think that we wear belts, and the reason we have a belt on is because it helps stabilize us. It helps keep my pants where they belong. helps me keep my shirt tucked in where it needs to go. And so the belt stabilizes us, but it's also a fashion thing. So I asked Rachel, hey, will you pull some belts out? That was a bad idea because my whole room exploded last night. And so she got all these belts. I don't even know what this one is. This kind of fancy. It's kind of made of some elastic stuff. Then she's got this one. I guess she went to a Hawaiian luau I didn't know about. I don't even know where this came from. (laughs) Then she's got all these little belts. And I looked at this belt, and I thought, if I put this on and ate three tacos, it would explode. And so, so my belts have to be a little bit more substantial. But for a Roman centurion, their belts looked a lot different. Their belts would be thick and made of three, four, five, six inches of leather, and they served a very important purpose in their life. When a centurion would get up in the morning, he would put on his robe, he would put on his cloak, and he'd put on this, it kind of looks like a dress, right? He'd put on this big red flowing garment over his whole body, and then over the cloak, he would put his belt. It's kind of like a superhero puts their underpants on the outside. That's what he would do with his belt, put his belt on the outside. And it served a lot of different purposes that I think we can pull some wisdom from. The first thing that the belt did is this. It allowed for advancement. It allowed for advancement. Because if you're wearing a long flowing robe, it's going to be very difficult for you to do some things. You're not going to be able to work because it's going to get in your way. You're not going to be able to run fast because it's going to get caught between your legs. And if you get into a battle, I don't want to be wearing a dress if I'm in a fight, right? And so they had this, this dress that they had to put this belt on, and the Bible says that they would take this garment and fold it up and tuck it into their belt. And all throughout scripture, we find references of men and women of God taking this garment and tucking it into their belt. There's a scripture that I've never preached, I'm going to someday, and it's going to be a fun one. But it's uh, found in 1 Kings 18, where Elijah finds himself in a situation where he's in a foot race with a chariot. It's unbelievable. And God gives him supernatural power, and here's what it says. It says, he tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way. I can't wait to preach that story someday. And so there's this idea that the belt is there so you can tuck some things into. And can I tell you something? When you wrap yourself in truth, it's going to help you in your advancement. It's going to help you to pursue everything that God has for you. Because that truth is the thing that helps eliminate things that would just get into your way. So the belt of truth, number one, it allows for advancement. Number two, it it helped hold them all together. The belt would hold them all together. It's kind of like a weightlifting belt. That if you're going to go to the gym, you're going to get a big weightlifting belt, and you're going to put that thing on. And the Bible says in some versions that it would help gird them, right? It's like a girdle. It's like spanks for a Roman soldier, right? And so they would put this thing on, and it would gird them. So if I'm going to the gym, and I'm going to do a really heavy squat, I'm going to put on a belt. If I'm doing a really heavy deadlift or power clean, I'm going to gird myself with a belt. And you see, truth, what it does is it helps you increase your own natural ability. It helps you increase your power. Because if you're not girded in truth, what, you, what can you do? You can injure your back. You can have a hernia. You can start having all of these problems. But truth holds everything in where it's supposed to be, so you need to wrap yourself in truth. The, second, the third thing is that the belt, it would secure other pieces of armor in place. The belt would secure other pieces of armor in place. A number of years ago, uh, well... I guess when I was a lot of years ago, I'm getting older, right? And so I roofed houses for a couple summers. And when I would roof houses, we would wear a tool belt, and the tool belt on it would have this uh, apparatus that would go over your shoulders and cross in the back and go between your legs. So in the event you lost your grip and fell off the roof, 
you wouldn't fall off the roof and die. And so, but the belt is the thing that would attach everything else to it and create a harness system so that you would be safe. And you see, in this day, the Roman guard, they would put on their belt, and at the top of their belt, they would affix their breastplate. It would hang, or it would be attached to their belt. That way, as they're fighting or they're running, the breastplate wouldn't just fly all over the place and cause them problems. They'd be very hard to fight with this big piece of metal flinging around. So it would attach to the top of the belt. And can I tell you something? That your righteousness has to be attached to truth. Because if your righteousness isn't attached to truth, when you get into a fight, you're going to find yourself vulnerable. Because your breastplate's going to fly up and the devil's going to stab you because your righteousness is based in your truth, not in God's truth. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching better than y'all help me out at 11 o'clock. And so we have to be intentional that we have our belt of truth to affix everything to it. But not only righteousness, the, the leg protection of a soldier, the, of their lower extremities, would be attached to the belt. And you see, the reason that you can walk in peace, shoes of peace, the reason you can walk in peace is because your peace is founded in truth. Because when your peace is founded in your own ideas or in your finances or in the kind of car that you drive or the kind of job that you have, can I tell you, that can be taken away. But truth can never be taken away. So we have to, we have to secure our peace in the truth that God has for us. So it allowed for their advancement. It would help hold them together. It would secure the other pieces of armor in place, but number four, it would help them keep the things they needed to take up close. The things they needed to take up. So I called my friend, uh, Chief Aaron, the police chief here in Mansfield, uh-oh, and I said, hey, can I borrow your, can I borrow your utility belt? And he said, yeah. I said, make sure you leave a gun in it. And he said, no. And I was like, oh, man. And so he gave me his utility belt. And so this police officer's utility belt, and so they'll put this thing on, and on it, they can house everything they need to take up. They have their gun, they have their taser, they have their baton, they have their flashlight. In the back, they have this little thing right here. I think that's a donut holster. I don't know. They have all of these different, it's for handcuffs, it's for handcuffs. They have all of these different things on their belt. He came after me after service, and he said, you're about to be in trouble with that donut joke. And... Uh, and they take all the things that they need to have close to them, and they can easily take them up. Can I tell you something? The flashlight in a squad car doesn't help a police officer at night. But because he has the implements he needs close to him, they're accessible. And can I tell you something, believer? That you have to have the things that God has for you secured close to you. You have to have truth to be the foundation. You know what a, you know what a soldier hangs on his belt? His sword. He hangs his sword from his belt. So the word that is our weapon is founded in the truth that we gird ourselves with. You might say, well, Tristan, aren't you supposed to preach about the word uh, of the Lord the last week when you talk about the sword? No, because the word of the Lord, the sword, is how we use it. But girding ourselves with it is the fact that we know it. We have to instill with ourselves. We have to wrap ourselves with God's truth. Come on, somebody. That's some good stuff. The belt is knowing it, but the sword is using it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says this. It says, study. Everyone say study. Study. study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that me- needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That we have to rightly divide the truth through study. That when we do that, we are girding ourselves. We are protecting ourselves with his truth, but we have to get it in us. Psalms 119.11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That through getting the word in us is the thing that helps us take a stand against the devil's schemes. We have to keep it close to us. The fifth thing that the belt would do is it would secure the Roman soldier's identity. It would secure their identity. So on that belt is where they would hang medals or ribbons. It would be the thing that displayed their rank. So when you saw a soldier coming and he was wearing his belt and his breastplate, you could see what rank in the military he was. And can I tell you something, church? That your identity has to be founded in God's truth. But so many people try to, try to identify themselves based on their physical appearance or the clothes they wear or the car in the parking lot or the money in their bank account or the title on their business card. We try to identify ourselves by all these other things, but true identity is found in God's truth. And I think that we have a great example of that that you can see on pay-per-view every Saturday night and when guys get one of these belts and they say, the heavyweight champion of the world, right? And they get that, can you smell, right? 
And so, you know, hey, if I wouldn't have been a pastor, I'd have taken some steroids and been a WWF wrestler, I'm just saying. And so what they do is they take up this belt, and this belt, it gives them their identity. I'm the heavyweight champion of the world. I pity the fool, right? And so they're ready for a fight. They're ready for a battle. And so what we need to do is we need to understand that truth is the thing that our identity is hung on. And so when we wake up in the morning, my prayer for this whole series is that we'll learn to wake up in the morning and put on truth. That we'll wake up and say, you know what, I don't want to put on the lie, but I want to define myself in the truth that God has for us. So we have to gird ourselves with it. We have to put it on. It does all these different things. But the question is, what is truth? What is truth? Truth is God's view on any subject. That's what truth is. The Bible says this in 2 Samuel 7. It says, you are God and your words are truth. Psalms 119, 160 says, the sum of your word is truth. So you add up everything in here and it's truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. I love that because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But if we base our truth off of our opinion, who knows that our opinion can change. But God ordinances are true forever. forever. John 17, 17 It says, your word is truth. But today, people will use man's views and man's opinions to build and facilitate the truth for their life. And that can get you in trouble because people will change their mind. You'll change their mind. You'll step into a new season of life. And if you change your opinion, that means you're changing your truth. And then everything mounted on your truth starts to get shaky because you simply changed your mind. We live in a world where truth is based on opinion and preference. And that's a dangerous place to be because... We tell people, well, if that's truth to you, well, then that's your truth. And so if I wake up in the morning and I say that the the earth is a triangle, then we're going to have Triangle Earth Day. And I'm going to make a t-shirt with a triangle earth. I'm going to say, hey, this is my truth. And you're going to say, well, if that's your truth, that's okay. You can have a parade for Triangle Earth Day, right? And so we do all of these things because one person says something is truth that we're just going to facilitate their truth. Can I tell you something? Just because a bunch of people vote for something doesn't mean that's truth. Now, we have to abide by the laws of the land. I'm not trying to cause anarchy, but I'm saying that we have to abide by the laws of the land, but God's word is truth, and this is what we have to abide by. This is what we have to listen to, knowing that what God says will not change. Y'all got quiet on me. That's okay. I'm not scared. You see, anyone who says anything in objection uh, to your truth, can, it can be like you're perceived as judgmental. Have you ever been there? And there's this idea that many people today would say, if you're a Christian but you think that you know truth, then really you're arrogant. If you're a Christian and you say that you know the truth, you know the way to God, then people could look and say, man, that's arrogant. You're an arrogant person, which I would disagree. Because just because you believe in what the Bible says doesn't mean you're arrogant. You know how I know that? Because there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that sometimes I don't like. Have you ever wanted to just cuss somebody out? I mean, just to be real serious. Like, you ever just got real mad and like, I just want to cuss that dude out. Have you ever just wanted to punch a joker in the nose? Like, you just get mad and right? You know what that is? That's your flesh. And so there are moments in life that the Bible tells me I should or shouldn't do things that go against what I want to do. But I've prescribed, I've girded myself with truth and said I'm not going to listen to my flesh, I'm going to listen to truth. So if someone were to say that because we think we know the truth, we're arrogant, well then I would look back and say, well then isn't it more arrogant to tailor truth based on your opinion? Come on somebody. It's more arrogant to tailor truth of the world based on your preference than it is a book that is written by God. Right. Y'all, don't, y'all don't like that. All right, I'll go on. I'll go on. <laughs> truth is God's opinion on any matter. Truth is absolute. Truth is independent of the mind of the knower. So just because we don't know the truth or we don't agree with the truth doesn't mean that what God says about a subject isn't really true. And the reason that we have to study to show ourselves approved, here's why. The reason we have to study to show ourselves proof, the reason we have to put truth on when we get up in the morning is because our enemy is a liar. The devil is a liar. And so he wants to come into your mind and come into your life and come into your family and tell you all kind of lies. But the only way that you can combat a lie is with the truth. So you have to gird yourself with it. John 8, 44, it says this. It says, he, speaking of the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. The devil's greatest tool, his greatest means of deception is a lie. 
It's the way that he gets into our minds and he tries to get us to think things or do things that are contrary to the word of God. It's happened all throughout scripture, y'all. Remember Adam and Eve? They're just hanging out in the garden. And then here comes up this little snake. He slithers up and he started asking questions. He started deceiving and saying, did God really say? And he starts questioning who God is. And he works at us with deception or I think of the end of, the end of Moses' life. Moses was this great impactful leader, but then the enemy got him through the deception of fear. And what if I can't do it? What if I can't accomplish everything that God says? He got Samson. Remember Samson? This big, powerful superhero in the Bible who was unstoppable. Then all the devil does is send this pretty young thing up his direction who starts lying to him. She chops off his hair. Next thing, his eyes are poked out, right? And so the enemy, he uses deception to come into our lives and manipulate and bring destruction. And the way that we combat those lies is with the truth. The only way to combat the lie is with the truth. But the problem is, with deception, is that embedded in deception is a blinding agent. It's like the enemy comes in and he lies to us, and then he blinds us to the fact that we're being tricked. Have you ever been talking to somebody, and they're saying something so crazy that you don't even understand what they're talking about? You're like, how do you think that's a good idea? Okay, wait a minute. You can't, you can't pay your bills. You're about to get evicted about your house, but you're going to go buy a brand new 2017 Tesla, right? This is what you're about to go do. You're about to go buy this brand new car. You're about to go buy this brand new sports car. You're about to go do this thing. Okay, wait a minute. I understand that you're having a hard time, but you're about to go on a vacation to Hawaii for three months. Wait a minute. What, what are you doing? Am I the only person that's ever had someone tell them something crazy? And so what happens is the enemy, he comes in and he tells us these little lies and then we think that we've got it under control, that we think we're not being lied to, but that's because of that blinding agent. Yeah. You ever talked to somebody and they said, yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to leave my wife. I'm going to leave my wife uh, because our, st- our relationship isn't really going very well, and so I'm going to leave her, and then I'm going to go date this other girl because she's sexing me up real good, and so I'm going to date her, and then I'm going to get married to her, and I'm going to leave her, I'm going to leave my kids, because God wants me happy, right? And so if God wants me happy, then I'm going to leave this because it's going to be better. I mean, I know we've got to get divorced. I've got to pay child support my whole life and all, but it's going to be better. Have you ever talked to somebody that's telling you things and you're sitting there and you're saying, I don't understand how you can't see what I see? Right. You don't know why? Because there's a blinding agent in the lies of the enemy. Yeah. So the dangerous thing, ready? The dangerous thing is that when he's lying to us, we don't know about it. Right. We know when he's lying to everybody else. We, can't you see it? We're really good at criticizing other people's lives. But then we look at our own self and we're going, man, I'm a genius. Like, I'm the smartest dude in here. I, I know what to do. I know when the enemy's tricking me. And so what we have to do is realize that his lies try to blind us to even do our own self. I learned a long time ago, I can't trust me. I can't trust me. I can't trust my own opinion. I can't trust how I think about things. So sometimes I have to, if I'm about to get into an argument, I have to say, hey, baby, hold on one second. And I got to go away and say, God, I need to gird myself with some truth. God, help me see myself. And then I realize, oh, I'm the problem in this situation anyways. I thought the ladies would have been helping me out with that one. And so we have to gird ourselves with truth because the enemy, he wants to come in and he wants to lie to us that we would see something different. James uh, chapter 1 verse 25. Man, it's so good. It's so good. It says, but the one who peers into, the one who looks, the one who studies, the one who looks at, who peers into the perfect law of liberty and fixes his attention there and does not become a forgetful listener, but the one who lives it out, he will be blessed in what he does. So what we have to do is we have to peer into the perfect word of God like a mirror. When we look into the word of God like a mirror, we realize that our reflection isn't always the right thing. Come on, somebody. And so we have to look into truth. The way that we put on truth is through looking into God's word and to say, you know what? The devil's lying to me. And I've been blinded to myself. Another great thing that you can do is surround yourself in godly community and actually listen to it. There's nothing more frustrating for me than someone say, hey, pastor, here's what's going on in my life. What do you think I should do? And then I tell them what they should do. And then three months go by, they do the opposite thing. And then they come and cry and they're like, hey, man, my life's even worse. I'm like, well, you didn't do what we talked about the first time, right? And so when we hear something, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. That we have to gird ourselves. I'm making some people mad. That's okay. That we have to gird ourselves in truth. John 8, 32, it says this. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. So being a disciple of God is not based upon knowledge, but it's based upon action. 
if you continue in my word, listen to what it says, then you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If you know the truth, then the truth will set you free. Notice that the truth isn't the thing that sets you free. Yeah. Say, Pastor, you're contradicting yourself. What are you saying? No, no, no. The truth, the truth is not the thing that sets you free. What is? The knowledge of the truth is the thing that sets you free. Because remember, truth is objective to the mind of the knower. It doesn't matter what we know. Truth is truth. But if we, I have hidden his word in my heart that I may not sin against him, we have to develop truth in our own heart. We have to gird ourselves with the belt of truth. You know, I was reading, and uh, I realized something kind of amazing. Abraham Lincoln signed the uh, emancipation of the slaves in America in, in 1863. So in January of 1863, he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And so slavery in America was now abolished and all slaves had freedom. But that message of truth didn't make it into the southern parts of Texas until much later, until June 19th, 1865. So that means for almost two years, the slaves in South Texas didn't know the truth. And because they didn't know, the truth was there. It was powerful truth. He signed the paperwork. The war was won. He signed it. But because they hadn't been educated yet of the truth, they still lived in bondage. You don't know why? Because the slave owners were selfish. And because they didn't want to abide by the law, so they kept manipulating the people they had power over. Can I tell you something the enemy's never going to do? The enemy's never going to walk up to you and go, hey, you're free. Hey do, you know, hey, do you know what the Bible says about you? The Bible says that you are a creation of God. The Bible says you're a son or daughter. The devil's not going to do that. You know why? He's a jerk, and he's a liar. And so what we have to do is we have to educate ourselves with truth so that we can be released, so that we can then find freedom. We have, we have to educate ourselves, y'all. The reason it's critical is because our enemy, he is a liar. He wants to lie to you about everything. He wants to lie to you about your past. He wants to lie to you about your present. He wants to lie to you about your future. He wants to lie about your family. He wants to lie about the gifts that God's instilled you with. So we have to fill ourselves with truth so that we can have an emancip pro emancipation proclamation over ourselves, that we are not in bondage, that we are equal to all, thing, all people that God has made, that we can do great things through him. We have to wrap ourselves in truth. And I've learned for me, that if I'll put the word in me when I don't need it, God will bring it out of me when I do need it. Right. People always say, Pastor Trust, when you preach, you like talk about all these different scriptures and reference this and reference that and talk about this thing here. And how do you do that? I don't know. I've just been filling myself with truth for a long time. And so the longer you fill yourself with truth, the more that truth just comes out. The more that you just speak things and you know things and you feel things that are based on not your opinion, but based on a... God that, man, loves you so much. It's, he loves us so much, y'all. It's crazy. Yeah. And he's given us this thing that will help us get through life if we would just hide it in our hearts. The truth of the redemptive power of Jesus Christ is so powerful that we have to know it. We need to know why God sent Jesus to earth. We need to know what he did while he was here. We need to know what he taught and why he taught it. We need to know what he said about his dad, what he said about his father, and why he said it. We need to know why he healed people. We need to know why Jesus allowed himself to be crucified on the cross. We need to know what happened when he died. We need to know where he went when he died. We need to know what he did while he was down there while he was dead. We need to know that he carried death, uh, hell in the grave in his hand when he rose again. We need to know that he ascended to heaven, but why did he go there? We need to know that Jesus is in heaven today, but what's he doing while he's up there? We need to know all of these things. And when we know all of these things and we gird ourselves with truth, it's upon that we can hang our righteousness. And it's upon that that we can have peace. It's upon that that we have a weapon to defend ourselves against the lies of the enemy. We have to cover ourselves in truth. So here's what I want to do. It's going to be a unique response this morning. A lot of us in this room have already found freedom in truth. That you were in bondage for a season of time. And then you found a scripture and God spoke something to you and you wrapped yourself in that for a day or for a week or for a month or for years. You just kept, you have those scriptures that you just wrap yourself in? Y'all you have those? You just wrap yourself in those scriptures? Here's what I want to do. I want to allow God to speak prophetically to some other people in the room through the scriptures that he used to set you free. And so I want you to begin to think about some verses or a portion of scripture that God gave you that you found freedom because of. It was the thing that you declared and it helped you find victory. 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a popcorn session, okay? Where some people in the room are just gonna stand up and I'm just gonna ask you to speak a scripture that God talk to you. I don't want you to tell your story. Well, I was born in 1945 back in Arkansas. No, we don't want that story. We want you to just say the scripture that God has spoken to you that you have used to wrap yourself in, and your words are going to be an inspiration to somebody else. Everybody understand what we're going to do? We're going to have 5, 10, 15 people. I don't know. We're just going to share a couple, and I want to show you how powerful truth is. So if that's you, just somebody start. Stand up, and you share a truth that God's given you. Yep. Yeah, that's right. He has a plan for you. Go, Adam. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's right. What else? Yeah. That's right. Yep. That's right. What else? Yep. When I was a child, I talked like a child. Yep. Yep. Yep, and I've seen that in my friend. Yep. Yep, that's right. What else? Nobody. We shouldn't fear anybody. You see, that's, that's a truth. The enemy starts to lie to us that we should be afraid. But then we recite that scripture, and it says, oh, I don't need to walk in fear. I don't need to know and live in bondage, because I know the plans he has for me, because I know that I can mature in myself, because I know that through him I'm victorious. What else? Go on. Yep. Through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, people around us shall overcome. Yeah. It's powerful. It's truth. What, yeah. Come on. That's a good one. That no matter what tries to come into your home, no matter what kind of lie tries to come in over your kids, you say, no, 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 devil. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You see, we have to gird ourselves with truth. Yeah. My heart in this whole series is that we will understand and learn that we need to wrap ourselves in what God says. Yeah. Because we're living in a spiritual war, y'all. Yeah. There's somebody who's literally plotting to bring destruction to you. But God, he knows the plans he has for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, give you a hope and a future. Yeah. And all we have to do is stand. But we've got to suit up before we do. Yeah. Before we move on, I've got to ask if there's anybody in this room that would say, you know, Pastor, today I came into church, but I'm far from God. I'm not in a relationship with him. Today we want to give you that opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The greatest truth you'll ever know is that he loves you. That God's not in heaven, this big angry guy looking for you after you mess up so he can squash you with a heavenly mallet, right? But he's a God who loves you. He exchanged the most valuable thing that he had, his son, for you. And all we have to do is ask him for forgiveness and he'll wash us clean. So all across this room, if you would, close your eyes and bow your heads. If that's you this morning, you'd say, today I wanna ask Jesus to forgive me my sins. On the count of three, really simply, just raise up your hand, look right up here, and we're going to pray for you. We're not going to embarrass you, we're just going to pray. If that's you, raise it up on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you this morning, don't wait. Say, today is my day. I want to ask Jesus Christ in my heart as my Lord and Savior. Come on, I'm going to give you just one more second. Living Church, here's what I know, is that we live in a world that needs truth. We live in a world that needs people to share love with them. And so when we go out this week, let's remember that we have the truth that people need to know a God who loves them. So don't just share what he's doing in you, but broadcast it. Be the light of the world. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you, God, that you have given us a truth that we can hang our identity on. That we are not defined by the sum of our life, by our mistakes and by the things we do good. But God, we're defined by you. So Lord, help me, help everyone at Living Church to wake up every morning and suit up. We thank you, Lord, in your name. We all said, amen.